Hi, QA in London Meetup Group members. Thank you for joining us for today's session, Test Automation Beyond Java 8 with NG Jones. I'm sure you're all familiar with our speaker, but before she kicks off, I'll give a short intro. Anyway, a senior developer advocate at Apply Tools, NG Jones specializes in test automation strategies and technique. A pillar of the global test automation community, NG is a world-renowned speaker and thought leader, and you can often find her presenting and teaching at international software conferences. Obviously now most of them are virtual. Uh, she's also the driving force and director of Test Automation University, a free online educational platform providing test automation courses by leading instructors. So be sure to check that out after our session. So without any further ado, Angie, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Adi. Hi everyone, Angie here. Today we're gonna to talk about test automation, specifically the new features in Java and how we can utilize them for test automation. So I don't think it's a secret to anyone. I love Java. I'm a Java champion. I teach free courses at Test Automation University, including Java programming, Selenium Web Driver with Java, visual testing with Java, and a couple of others as well. Now, while Java is still the leading programming language, it's gotten a bad rep over the years. So some of the biggest gripes that I've heard are things like Java is too verbose, meaning we have to write a lot of code, right, to do the most basic things in Java. Another one that I've heard is that the language wasn't evolving fast enough. So the releases of Java 7, 8, and 9 were all three years apart, which is almost a lifetime in software development time. Fortunately, the powers that be have heard us loud and clear, and Java's gotten a much needed makeover. And now new versions of the language are being released every six months. In fact, yesterday was the release of Java 15. What version are you on? You know, I'm sure not all the way up to Java 15. So with these six month releases, there's lots of features that are being given to us and it could be hard to keep up. So in this talk, I wanna demonstrate some of the newer features of Java, especially some of my favorite ones that I find most useful for test automation. And I'll show you um, using some code how to take advantage of them in writing your tests. So we're gonna look at some automation code for verifying this banking page. The specific test we'll go over today is just going to make sure that all of the accounts here are listed. So here's our test. And let me walk you through this. So here we're logging into the application and we get a handle to this accounts overview page. So this is where that table of accounts is located. Next, we get a list of the account numbers that are displayed on the page. And then we wanna get the expected accounts. So this test data can change. So we're actually going to make a call to an API to get the expected accounts. And this will return a list of deserialized account objects. So we want to make a new list, which will only contain the account numbers as strings, as opposed to the entire account object. And we look through the list of account objects and we're going to add the account number from each account into our list of expected account. And then finally, we compare both lists to make sure every account for this customer is actually shown on the site. Okay, so this test was written in Java 8. So what we're gonna do is go through this and we're gonna see how we can modernize this using some of the latest features in Java. Cool? All right, let's go. We're gonna start here 
with the declaration of the accounts overview page. Now, as you can see here, we're following Java conventions. You know, we're using good names for both the class and the object. However, many times, as we can see here, these two names are actually the same thing, right? So this is redundant. It makes for a lot of typing. So in version 10, Java introduced type inference for local variables. And what this means is that instead of explicitly declaring the object or the variable's type, we can instead use this keyword var. And Java will infer what the type is based on what is being assigned to it. So this is my favorite new feature in Java because as you all know, in automation code, we always have like these long class names for our page object models. And now we no longer need to type those out. Now, before you get carried away and start using var everywhere, I wanna explain the rules and then also give you some tips. So, this does not make Java a dynamically typed language like JavaScript or Python. The type is still there, it's just inferred from the right-hand side of the statement, which means you can only use var if you're actually initializing the variable. Otherwise, Java's not gonna be able to infer what the type is, right? Also, it only works for local variables. So you can use this inside of methods, loops, decision structures, but you can't use it for global variables, even if you are initializing them. If you can't do that, you'll get a compilation error. Now, while the local type Local variable type inference, long name. <laughs> um, while that can be used within the body of local constructs, it can't be used in the headers of you know methods or constructors. And this is because whoever is calling you, they need to know the data type of the arguments they, that they should send to you. Okay, so those are the rules. Now let me share some guidelines. Given this variable name x and this method name get x, I, I have no idea what the inferred data type of x would be, right? Sure, Java knows because Java knows the signature of the get x method. And, you know, I can figure it out by going to that method or maybe my, um, my IDE will give me, you know, some information if I hover or something like that. But as far as just reading this code, I can't easily tell what it is. So this makes it more difficult to work with this variable. Now, of course, you should always use good variable names, but it's even more important if you're going to use var. Once you get started using this feature, you're going to love it, but please don't overdo it. So in this case, like why would you use var, right? We can see based on the value, the inferred data type would be what? Int, right? And int is three letters, var is three letters. So this does you no favors, right? Don't just go slapping var all over the place. You know, use it where it makes sense. Okay, so I've updated our test method to use vars. So I'm using var here, and the inferred type is very clear to me because as the reader, um, the variable name that I chose was pretty good. Yay, Angie, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> however, here I, I changed the variable name from actual accounts to actual account IDs list. And the reason I did that is so that it's clear that this is a list and it's holding the account ID. So you can see, even though I used a good variable name before, which was actual accounts, when I remove that data type, then it becomes a little bit ambiguous, right? So because I removed that context, I changed the name of the variable to give more context. Okay, for this one, I also changed the name from accounts to accounts list so that it's clear this is a list holding account objects. Here, I changed the name to be more representative, and I also explicitly defined the data type 
of array list um, of the array list on the right hand side. So you see that string right there in the diamond operator. If I didn't use this diamond operator to indicate that this is a list of strings, then it would be inferred by Java as a list of objects. And that's okay in this particular case, but this could get you into trouble down the road. For example, if let's say I wanted to get one of the elements from this list, and I wanted to use the dot operator, and I'm expecting to be able to access the uh, string methods, right? If I didn't explicitly declare this as string, then Java would have inferred that it was an object, and so I wouldn't have access to those string methods. So that's why that's important to do. Okay, and then... Here, I'm using var inside of a for loop just to show you that it can be done there as well. Okay, let's see what else we can modernize. How about let's look inside of this get accounts method. Now, remember, this is the table and we're getting all of those values in the first column labeled account. And here's the code to do so. So we see here. It finds all of the account sales, and these are web elements. And then it creates a new list to hold just the text of the web elements. So this is a list of strings. And then to populate that list, we loop through each of the elements from line three. We get their text, and then we add them to our new list on line six. And notice this method needs two lists and a loop. Of course, there's a more modern approach to do this in Java using a functional programming style. So this approach was actually added in Java 8, but I don't see it used much in test code, so I want to highlight it. So this is much more streamlined, yes, than using the two um, lists and the loop. Let me walk you through what's going on here. We're still calling find elements to get the list of web elements, but we don't need to store them. Instead, we turn them into what's called a stream, right? And then from which we can do some cool functional programming. So in Java 8, these functional programming capabilities appeared in the language. And this was revolutionary for Java. Um, so we really should take advantage of these in our test code, okay? So what this does is essentially um, gets, uh, I guess, like a collection. So in this case, it's a list, but it could be like a map or something like that as well. But it gets this collection and puts it in the state where you can do further processing on that collection, okay? So um, from there, we call this map function, and this will take those web elements and it's going to map them into whatever is passed into here, right? So this is taking like the entire list from find elements, and it's getting the text from every single web element right? So it's only getting that part. And then it's going to store all of that text inside of a list, which we then return. Okay. All right. So here's an alternative way to write that map call. So notice in the top example, line five uses a shortcut or what's called syntactic sugar. So it's saying web element and then colon, colon, get text. But in the bottom example, line three uses the fully spelled out approach. So it's saying, given some variable name E, which is representative of elements, and then it uses an, a lambda style arrow, which is common in functional programming. And it's saying for every E here, go ahead and get its text, right? So both of these do the exact same thing. When you only have like one method call here, most people go ahead and use the top example. Okay, so we can do the exact same thing in our test method. So instead of using the two list in a for loop, I use a stream and then I map 
what I need into a single list. All right. So it's a good practice to break up these chains method calls where each method call is on a new line. Now, I know it's really tempting to do this big, powerful call all on one line because it's like, wow, look at this wicked one liner, right? <laughs> but that makes it harder to read your code and process what it's actually doing. Also, if you break it up, like this, then a lot of the um, IDEs, I know IntelliJ, uh, definitely IntelliJ will allow you to put breakpoints on, you know, these sub calls basically. So good practice to break it up, put it on its own new line. Okay, let's look at what came after Java 8 with strings. So Java 9, introduces a couple of new methods to stream. Um, there's several that you know I haven't covered because this talk is about beyond Java 8, but there's several in Java 8 like you know filter and all of this. So I encourage you to look into those if you haven't already. Um, but Java 9 has some new methods, one being take while. And let's say I have this code which gets the list of accounts. And then it uses the take while method on this stream of accounts. So within the take while method, you need to pass a condition. And this is also known as a predicate. And notice that lambda style arrow again. So this is saying to go through this list of accounts and accept all of the ones that have a type of checking until you get to one that does not have this type. So here are all of the accounts stored in accounts list. Notice there are 11 of them. And when we say take while type is checking, we end up with a list of three accounts. And as you can see, it's the first three accounts from the accounts list. But when we got to the fourth account, the type was savings. So the stream ended, even though there were more checking ones after that, the way that take while works is it's going to stop. It's going to halt once the condition is no longer true. Okay, so Java 9 also introduced drop while, and this does the opposite of take while. So for this one, we're saying drop the accounts of type checking until you get to one that is not. So with 11 accounts here, we see the first three are checking, the fourth is savings, the fifth through the ninth are checking, the 10th is savings, and the last one is checking. So how many accounts do you think are gonna be collected here in the checking accounts list using the drop while um, type is checking? If you said eight, you are correct. So this method dropped the first three accounts, right? Because they matched the predicate. And then it stopped the stream on the fourth one because it no longer matched the predicate. So all other accounts are then collected and stored into the list. Now, all of those accounts couldn't fit on the last slide. So here's the full list of drop while account type is checking. Okay, so you might be thinking, Angie, why on earth would I want to use take while and drop while? <laughs> um, well, these examples I showed you were a bit of a brain tease because the lists weren't sorted. So the results were indeterministic. However, if you sort the collection first, as we're doing here on line five, it makes a lot more sense. And notice I'm using this comparator to specify which property of this object that I want this entire thing uh, sorted by, right? So it's going to sort. Uh, it's going to sort by the type. Now, given the sorted list, we see it collects all of the checking accounts, and this actually makes more sense, right? Likewise for drop while. 
Okay, let's see what else we can modernize in our test. How about let's go inside of this get customer ID method. So this method is holding our test data and based on the name on the account, it's returning the account ID. And this is using switch statements. And notice we have to declare the variable and then we specify each case that we wanna handle. And inside of the case, we assign the value to ID and then we must follow the assignment by a break statement to prevent fall through into the next case which would override the variable. Now, not only is this a lot of boilerplate code, but it's also risky. If you forget one of those break statements, then it's going to fall through and the wrong ID is going to be returned. And actually, I made this mistake not too long ago <laughs> um, and was wondering like why I had this bug and that's exactly why, right? And I'm sure this has happened to you as well. You forget a break in one of the cases. Fortunately, in Java 12, switch expressions were introduced. So now you can use switch to directly assign a value to a variable. So notice here we are using switch on the right side of a statement to initialize this variable. And the case statement doesn't need a colon in switch expressions, but instead it uses an arrow. And this is saying, if the name is John, then assign 12212 to the variable ID. Notice, I don't need a break statement. So there is no fall through in switch expressions, right? I can even simplify this a bit more by removing the assignment here and then just returning the result of the switch expression. Now, using the Lambda style arrows is one way to assign the value, but you can also use another approach. You can use the colon that we're used to, but if you do, you need to follow it with the word yield. So yeah, this is a bit more verbose. So I prefer to just use the arrow, but I'll show you where yield comes in handy in um, a little bit, all right? Um, with switch expressions, you can also specify more than one case. So this kind of takes care of fall through because if um, you think about it, sometimes you do wanna use fall through. Like there's sometimes where the code that you're gonna write matches more than one case. So you can handle that here. Notice we're saying if the customer name is John or Demo, which is his last name, then the ID is 12212. So again, that makes up for the removal of the fall through from um, switch expressions because you can indicate all of the cases delimited by a comma. Now you can also do more than just assign values. So this is what I was telling you about where yield comes in handy. So for example, here we're using the Lambda style arrow followed by a set of curly braces to indicate that we wanna do more than just assign a value. So inside of the body of this case, we can add more statements like this one, but the last line of the case must yield a value to be returned, right? Because remember, switch expressions is all about assigning values to variables. So if you, know, you wanna do a whole bunch of other statements, you can, but at the end of the day, you have to give some result back, okay? Let's talk about the rules. So you'll need to use the arrows or the colon yield. You can't like mix and match this like this. So line three is gonna give you a compilation error because it's a different kind of case. And you can use yield with the arrows, but only in events like the last case. Let me show you. Like this, right? So you can use it with the arrows, but it has to be where you're using the curly brace as well. 
Um, okay, and then you can use any of the cases to throw an exception. So of course, in this example, no value is being returned for ID if the default case is executed because the entire flow is interrupted by the exception. Now, I put this on the default case, but that's not the only case. You can put it on any of these cases. So if I wanted to throw an exception for case Mary, that's perfectly legal. Also, you can do it in multiple cases. So if I wanted to throw it in the case of Mary and also in the default case, that's fine. I could throw different exceptions, one, one type of exception for Mary, one type of exception for default, all of that is legal. Now, this is not a replacement of the switch statement. It's a addition to the language, meaning you can still use your switch statements. And in some cases, that might even be the more favorable option. So as a rule of thumb, use expressions when you're using the switch to assign a value and use statements when you're not using switch to assign values, but you just want to invoke statements, okay? All right, let's go back to our test. And how about we go into this get accounts method, which is an API call. So this method is making a get call to get all of the accounts for the specified customer. And it's then deserializing that response into an array of account objects. And let's look at the API response for this. Notice we have an array of these account objects and each account has an ID, a customer ID, a type, and a balance. So I have this Pojo class. Um, Pojo is plain old Java objects, right? Meaning it just has some fields and then some getters and setters. So that's all that's in this class. And for any of you who have created a Pojo, you know that this is tedious to do. Many people have moved to using like external libraries such as Lombok so that they don't have to write all of this boilerplate code. But great news in Java 14, which was uh, released in March, a new construct has been introduced called records. This is a record. Pretty, huh? Much, much shorter than that Pojo. And guess what? This is all you need. Let me break it down for you. Notice here, instead of using the word class, we use the word record. Also, as opposed to opening this with a curly brace, we use parentheses to declare the fields. And you specify the fields and their data types in this comma delimited list. And then you close it with a closing paren and a set of curly braces, and that's it. <laughs> you don't need to make any getters, you don't need to make any setters, you don't need to override the inherited methods of equals and hash code or two string. All of that is just done behind the scenes for you and it's done quite nicely. However, if you just want to override anything or you just want to add something, you can do so within those curly braces. So just open the curly braces up and add whatever you want to the body of the record. Records can be instantiated just like classes. So account is the name of our record and we use the new keyword to invoke the constructor, passing the values, just like we would do with any other class. Now, the fields of a record are final. So that means there are no set methods that are generated for records. Of course, you can add a setter within the curly braces yourself, but I don't see a good reason to do this since the fields are final and they can't be modified anyway. You do have accessor methods. However, they don't start with the word get. Instead, the accessor method name is the same as the field name. So notice here, we're making a call to account.balance as opposed to account.getBalance. Records were released as a preview feature in Java 14. So what this means is that it's not yet a permanent feature of the language. So that's the great thing about the new release cycle of Java. Um, 
most of the time they're releasing the features as previews, like a couple of versions before it becomes final. And what this does is it gives us engineers uh, opportunity to play around with the features and offer feedback. And based on that feedback, the implementation can change. So that's pretty cool. But that also means that you shouldn't be using this in your uh, test code just yet because it's not permanent and it can change, right? It also means that support from external libraries might not be available just yet. For example, the Jackson library is used to deserialize that JSON response into this record. However, uh, the Jackson library doesn't officially support records yet. So as a hack, you'll need to explicitly bind each field to its respective JSON property. And when and if records becomes permanent, then the Jackson project will provide support so that the explicit binding isn't necessary. So that's just one example, but there could be other, you know, external Java libraries that are in the same boat. And I don't know that, you know, they will be updated. Hopefully they will, but, you know, most of the libraries we're using are open source ones. So uh, hopefully the community pitches in. All right, next, I want to show you some text blocks. So this is another one of my favorite features. Let's continue on with the API. Now, what if instead of calling the API, we just wanted to mock the data right there in the API util class? To represent this whole thing as a string would be very tedious. We need to escape all of the fields because they're already in quotation marks, right? We need to add new line characters for each of the line breaks, and we need to add these plus signs for each line. So this is ugly. It's ugly to read. It's ugly to write. No one likes to do this. Text blocks will allow you to use three quotation marks to open and close a big block of text. Isn't that beautiful? You don't have to escape anything. The individual quotation marks are still there on the fields. The line breaks are respected. This is a work of art. <laughs> text blocks were introduced in Java 13 as a preview feature and we got a second preview in the latest uh not the latest <laughs> these things are coming fast um in the java 14 release in march so this actually became a permanent feature yesterday um in java 15 so yay you can go ahead and add this to your test code if you upgrade to java 15. All right, let's look at some rules and guidelines about text blocks. So you cannot include the entire text blocks on the same line or you're going to get a compilation error. And when you think about this, why would you have this big block of text on one line, right? Um, a new line must be after the opening quotes, like in the second example here. Now this way is legal, but it's not preferred because that looks a little goofy and unbalanced, right? The preferred way is to have both the opening and the closing quotes aligned on their own separate lines and then have your big block of text right there between them. Now, I needed to fit <laughs> these three examples on one slide, which is why um, I'm only using this small string. But don't use text blocks for this small string, y'all. <laughs> you know, this was just for demonstration purposes. Use a string there. But when you have a big block of text, you can use the text blocks. All right, one more thing I want to show you in that API class. Let's say that we didn't want the entire response but wanted to just return a hard-coded list of the expected account IDs. Now, the old way of doing this would be to use the arrays.addList method. However, in Java 9, this of method was introduced for all entities in the collection framework. So lists, maps, sets, et cetera, right? Now, this one seems small, but I've actually really been enjoying this. And I think the reason 
for that is that it's more natural for me. So before it took like a slight cognitive effort to recall which class do I use to make a quick list, for example. You know, is it a ray? Is it a rays, plural? Like which one is it? But now I want a list, I call list.of. I want a map, I call map.of. So it's nice and straightforward. And speaking of maps, populating these required a separate method call for each item that we wanted to add to the map. Now you can define a map all with one line of code. So the parameters are key followed by value. And so you can see here that we have three entries in this one line. Now I'll put this all on one line because you know, I'm a developer and we like to <laughs> we like to have slick one liners, but in reality, I probably would break this up into um, three separate lines where each entry was on its own line, just so that I don't get confused about which key goes with which value. One um, thing to note about using the of method is that it creates collections which are immutable. And what this means is that the collection cannot be changed by adding, removing, or sorting it later. So only use this when your collection won't require any changes later on in the program. All right. So there you have it. These are a few of my favorite new features from recent versions of Java. I've been using them in different uh, test projects. I find them quite useful even for test code. What questions can I answer for you? Are there any? Yeah, of course. Uh, so first one, have you run into uh, breaking changes uh, when you migrate to newer versions? No, they've done a really good job with um, backwards compatibility. So when you upgrade, you should be fine. It's only like new additions. Um, there may have been like some deprecations, but you know, that's normal. But yeah, I don't know of any breaking changes, but there is a guide written by a woman named Trisha G, G-E-E. -E. If you look up Trisha G migrating Java, then you'll find um, some information. So she's done like blog posts, videos, the works on um, some kind of gotchas about upgrading and stuff like that. Um, can switch expression work with more than one assignment? Great question. So switch expressions, you can say, um, let's say you want to say int, um, I need a variable name. I hate to use like X or foo and bar and stuff. I can't think of anything on the spot. Um, int X comma Y equals and then do the switch expression right and then you would be assigning that value to both of those variables yes <clears throat> is it possible when using uh, selenium java to take uh, an entire page screenshot including console network tab um that's outside of the scope of this talk but um console network tab i don't i don't no i don't think you can get like the actual browser page as well as the dev tools in the screenshot i've not seen the ability to do that i'm not 100 percent sure because i haven't tried it but um my gut is telling me no okay um, so, uh, to use setters, uh, will we still need to define them separately as records can replace the replace setters alone? So the records are final entities, right? So if you're looking for something like, oh, I'm trying to make like a builder class or something like that, then records are not your best option because you can't modify those fields after the initial initiation of those variables. So um, 
putting a setter there is actually going to give you a compilation error because the values cannot change. So I wouldn't use that if I'm doing something like um, a builder class or if I, if I know that I need to modify the values after the fact. I would use it for things where I already know the values up front. They don't need to change. Like say, for example, um, I wanted to verify like an API response. I already know what the API response is going to be. So I can use a record really quickly to basically um, serialize uh, an object that represents what that response is going to be. And then I can do a quick assertion um, based on the actual response and then that record that I created to see if it's equal. So that's a, a good use case for that. If it's something that you're crafting, like you need to get the data and then you're going to update it later, records is not a good choice. Just use a regular POJO class. So there is still, you know, people were asking if records is going to uh, replace Lombok or whatever. I see there's still a use case for Lombok because, you know, with the records, they're immutable. <clears throat> Some open source libraries don't seem to support Java 9 and onwards. Have you found this to be a limitation? Yeah, so most people are still on Java 8. Um, <laughs> even though there's like a push to move folks further along in the language, it's so funny because in the beginning of the talk, I talked about some of the complaints and everybody was like, oh, the language isn't evolving fast enough, three years for a language. And they said, okay, we'll give you new features every six months. And now everyone is like, oh my God, it's going too fast. Slow down, we can't keep up. And nobody's moving off of Java 8. Um, it's hilarious to me actually, but there's lots of um, new features available and I guess even the OS, OSS maintainers can't really keep up. What's a good um, thing that they're doing is trying to stay at least up to date with the long-term release version. So every three years will be the long-term release. So Java 8 is a long-term support um, and then the next one is Java 11. So Java 11 is the long-term support language now. So really, if you were to upgrade, I would recommend upgrading to Java 11. Even though we're on Java 15, um, the long-term support is Java 11. Now, most of the OSS maintainers will go ahead and target that. Like they're not gonna be chasing Java every six months, you know? but they'll go ahead and add support for at least the, the LTS version, which is Java 11. So we have more compatibility questions. So is Java 14 compatible with other testing frameworks such as JUnit and Cucumber? And is it compatible with Jenkins? Yeah, it's compatible with everything so i've been um i've been, i always upgrade to the latest because you know i love java and i want to be on the cutting edge and you know help my folks understand what's going on so java 15 was released yesterday i haven't had a chance to download that one yet but i'm working with java 14 so everything that i'm doing right now is in java 14 i just automatically update and then um i keep all the rest of my libraries the same i haven't had to update any other libraries when I update my Java version. So my Selenium still works, my JUnit still works, and some projects I use testing G, that still works. Um, my CI stuff like Jenkins still works. Everything still works. So there's really, I'm not really sure what the big hesitation is when people are afraid to move um, other than like licensing issues. So the licensing issues for anyone who's not aware, um, Oracle has changed like their licensing uh, terms after I think Java 8. So Java 11, if you're going to use this in like production code, then you do have to license a version, which I think is a, also um, preventing some people from upgrading. 
But for us, fortunately, with our test code, we're covered. We don't need license for test code. It's only for production code where those licensing things apply. So if you're just writing test code and you're not shipping that test code out to customers, then um, you're okay to use the the version. There's also the open JDK version. So there's Oracle's version of Java and then the open source community does their own as well. So open JDK does not have those licensing restraints. So a lot of folks just use that one. Um, and another question about um, about features. So people are asking if uh, all the features that are available on Java 12 are also available on Java 14 and 15. Yep. Um, so yeah, they they progress on. They might change if there's like if one of them was a preview feature, it could change. For example, when switch expressions was first introduced, they weren't using the word yield. They were using another word, maybe return or something. And so, like I said, with the preview features, this gives us an opportunity to provide feedback back to um, the maintainers. So when we were using the switch expressions, people were like, uh, oh, this return feels a little weird. It feels like I'm returning out of a method. You know, you use return when you're trying to get out of the entire method. So it didn't feel right in the switch expression, you know? Um, so they changed it from return to yield, right? So that came in the next release, which was still a preview. So from that version to the next, you know, the, the um, language changed on that feature, but that was a preview feature, right? So you'll see some changes with some preview features, but, um, once they make it into the language, then they're pretty consistent when you go forward. Okay, I hope I get this next question correctly. Uh, is it possible to define a build inside a record? A builder? So, okay, technically it's possible because I saw somebody do it. <laughs> So someone was like hacking around with um, the new Java version and um, they did like a whole bunch of wow things with records, things that, you know, you wouldn't do in your real code, but they were just having a good time and, and, and bending limits and stuff. So they were able to somehow, I don't even remember how they pulled it off, but they were able to get, um, builder inside of a record but again records are immutable so it's not like this straightforward thing where you just say oh um you know update the name field to this there is no updating of the field you know um so i would not use records if i'm trying to make a builder i would use a regular class in that case Okay, a lot of questions about uh, about records. So can I use record class to implement interfaces classes? So records are final. Um, there's a few things. So I explored this whole interface and inheritance thing with records. Let me find my notes on that. Um, do, 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 do. Bear with me. We have some time, so. Uh, where did I put it? I think, here we go. All right, so let's see. You all are asking amazing questions. Okay, so um, since records of final, you cannot inherit from other classes or other records, right? So if you try to inherit from, um, if you try to inherit from a class, you're going to get an ex, uh, a compilation error, right? It says no extends clause allow for records. So you can't extend. Um, if you try to extend from another record, then it's going to also give you a compilation error. It's gonna say you cannot inherit from a final record. As far as implementing interfaces, that you can do, right? So you can use a record to implement 
an interface. Um, is typecasting uh, easier using the newer Java versions? Yeah, there's some, um, there's a new instance of pattern that um, I haven't used this one in test code. I've used it to like play around just to see what it's about. But basically like, you know, when you um, are using like polymorphism or whatever, and you want to check if it's an instance of something. So you would do, in the old versions, you would say if um, object A is an instance of object B, and then inside of that body, you would then do your casting. You would say, okay, so since it is an instance of, let me go ahead and cast to um, object B, right? Now, they've kind of streamlined this a bit. So now you could do it in the condition itself. So you can say, if object A is an instance of, and then you would put the actual object. So object B, and then you would give it a variable name. So it's a check and then also a cast all into one, right? So that came uh, in Java 14 in March. Uh, what version of Java would you recommend we use for production? Java, I would, I would recommend you use the long, um, the LTS, which is long-term support, whichever version that is at the time. So right now that's Java 11. That's what I would recommend you upgrade to. So I see we do have some more questions, um, but I do want to turn it over to Ashley because we're five minutes to the top of the hour. I do want to let Ashley uh, a chance to uh, to say a few words. Uh, so obviously you can reach out to um, to Angie on social media on Twitter uh, if you have any additional questions. And um, just before Ashley will take over, uh, I just want to thank you all for joining us today, and of course thank Angie and remind you that whenever the um, the recording is available online and Ashley will be, Ashley will let you know about that. So Ashley, over to you. Excellent, thank you very much Adi and thanks for um, obviously taking care of the organization for this this evening as well. Um, Angie, thank you very much for taking your time to put this talk together and obviously give that to the group this evening. Um, yeah, very, very great, but you know, very good presentation and, and obviously good engagement at the end there. So thank you everybody for, for joining us and for your questions as well. Um, like Adi said there, we'll get the recording out um, to you ASAP. Um, I know the guys at uh, Avatars are busy over the next couple of days with other events, but uh, as soon as the recording is available, we'll get that sent out. Um, any any questions from anyone else, feel free to uh, send them directly through to myself. I can pass them on to Angie and the team as well. But uh, no, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, I'll speak to you all soon.